Hey folks, welcome to class. Today we're going to talk about descriptive writing. We're going to talk about how to write uh, evocative, strong, effective descriptions of, of just about anything you can describe. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Some fundamental information. So description really is our most fundamental goal of writing. All other goals that you may have for your writing, whether it's to argue or analyze or question or entertain or persuade, all of those ultimately use description as their foundation to, to do any of those things, to analyze, question, persuade, or argue for an issue, you have to first be able to explain it to your audience. If you can't explain uh, a problem to your audience, you can't explain uh, your solution, right? So that explanation is description. That's why it, it uh, is, is a fundamental element of writing. It, it kind of underlies anything else you're going to do. Now, Description isn't just some, some sort of academic thing that I'm asking you guys to do in class. Um, it underlies uh, uh, a lot of what you're going to be doing in real life. In all walks of life, you will be describing things to others, like in your job, no matter what it is. Uh, as a doctor or a nurse, you'll write patient assessments. Um, in the sciences, uh, you'll describe the experiments you've conducted and the, the reactions or the results that you got um, and the any conclusions that you've made based on on that information heck as an auto mechanic you'll still describe a vehicle specific malfunction to its owner so that he or she will uh, be able to understand what needs to be done to repair it <clears throat> so just about everything you, you do is going to involve description in some way. And so understanding uh, the fundamentals of providing a solid description is going to help you not just in this class and other classes, but, but honestly out there in the real world and, and uh, doing whatever, whatever job or, or, or um, interacting in whatever ways you do. Now, when you describe something, this is probably obvious, uh, you indicate how it appears what it looks like and sounds like and feels like, smells like, maybe even tastes like. Um, to do that effectively, uh, we have a number of techniques. First of all, uh, we provide specific details about whatever it is our subject, uh, whatever it is we're describing. We use descriptive language to build in the reader's mind as clearly as possible uh, an image of that thing that we're describing. It's not enough for us just to recognize um, that uh, uh, we know about a thing and we're going to explain that thing to somebody else. A lot of times it's very easy to skip information that you're going to, that you should provide, but you don't think to because you already know it. <clears throat> so a lot of times those descriptions, which may seem like they're very easy to do, actually require a lot of prior thought and a lot of uh, uh, thinking about the rhetorical context. Once again, not just about yourself, but about your audience, about your goal, um, about the type of medium that you're communicating through, um, all those sorts of things. So anyway, uh, for some descriptions, simply explaining the important details, it's all that's necessary, right? If you're, if you're doing the auto mechanic bit, you just need to say what's malfunctioning, maybe how it's malfunctioning and what needs to be done to, uh, uh, to fix it, whether it's something that can be repaired or if it needs to be replaced in part or in, in its entirety and how much that'll cost, how many, how, how, what, what's the time that it'll take to do so, those kind of things. Um, the goal might be only to give the audience a general understanding of what something looks like or how it acts. And in those cases, that type of description is perfectly fine. However, by also incorporating uh, language that invokes a reader's senses or emotions, not just direct descriptions, not just literal descriptions, but using uh, words and phrases that have additional meaning, emotional meaning sometimes, 
um, we can create especially effective descriptions because that language connects to the reader not just intellectually we don't we, we, we don't we not only know what the words mean but they also connect with us emotionally words have power right being symbols for things they all mean something a little bit different to each of us I think I've explained before that if I uh, wrote up the word blue and had all of you uh, in class choose uh, different Pantone swatches um, for which is the bluest blue you can imagine just about all of you would have would choose slightly different blues and so we all see the world a little bit differently uh, not only through physical lenses like our eyes and our other sensory abilities but also through um, cultural lenses how we've been brought up so words being symbols some of those words have a very particular meaning uh, some people put a lot of emphasis on the word respect though sometimes they don't seem to know what what respect means it doesn't mean obedience right it's a little different a lot of people have values on a uh, place a, a high value on uh, uh, words like uh, uh, trust and and honesty and courage and love those have uh, a dictionary definition but they also have very particular uh, individual emotional meanings to us too right ones that are, are difficult for us to us to express exactly well by using those words you can affect someone not just intellectually but also emotionally and that's what you would want to do in a lot of cases especially if you're trying to provide a particularly evocative a passionate description of something so uh, uh it's important to recognize that um that our language choices matter here it's another part of that rhetorical concept uh context to to think about when we describe things that is writing strong descriptions requires you to consider several things just beyond uh, beyond just the specific physical traits of the thing you're describing you need to think about how your audience is going to respond how certain words may affect them how you can modify your description to uh, create uh, an emotional tone and those sorts of things if you're doing something more than just you know describing uh, a scientific uh, or a mathematical equation or, or a scientific formula or something like that uh, an evocative description oftentimes is 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 a lot more effective than just a uh, by the books here's the the definition of things um, explicit description so as I said the rhetorical context will help guide you regarding what considerations you need to make to build those strong descriptions so let's talk about those things <clears throat> you do want to consider the rhetorical context as you build descriptions the better you understand the rhetorical context of your writing uh, the more effective your descriptions will be but it's not just descriptions either the more effective any writing that you do any communication you do uh, uh will be right it doesn't matter if you're writing an essay or trying to convince the judge to to throw out uh i don't know uh, uh your speeding ticket you need to think about uh what kind of language is going to be most effective in those cases right you talk to your best friend differently than you talk to your your grandmother hopefully um and uh, uh you know there there's a certain emo uh, emotional distance you have a certain um uh, uh objective distance uh you're supposed to have when you're talking to um uh, your superiors right authority figures bosses and police officers and judges and parents and things like that and so already you you use the rhetorical context um to alter how you how you uh communicate and this is just another example of that instead of it being just entirely based on um how you talk to someone here we're talking about how you use the rhetorical context uh to write descriptions so let's think about some elements of the rhetorical context one is our topic 
you should have a clear image and understanding of the thing you're going to describe. The more familiar you are with this thing, the better you will be able to describe it. Um, obviously, you know, this is one of those things where you can do some pre-writing on, uh, write down all the things you remember about a particular uh, uh, subject, whatever it is you're writing about. If you're writing about a location, that would be one of the very first things to do is write down all the, the things you remember about that place or uh, go there. Talk to people who go there. Um, those kind of things, what we call uh, primary research and write down the things that you you sense not just the things that you see but but hear and and smell and 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 feel while you're there right uh the better you understand a topic the better you understand whatever it is your your subject is whether you're describing a person or a place or an object or whatever um the better your description is going to be uh effective description can come only from close experience and intimate knowledge of your of your topic so um it's important yeah uh, especially if you're not able to to say visit a location you know use some photos um do some research online remind yourself um what a place is like or what a person is like or what an object is like um and and constantly refresh yourself to remember what it is you're you're talking about um, the more knowledge you have about whatever it is you're talking about, the better a description you'll be able to provide. Another element of the rhetorical context to pay attention to is your audience. You always pay attention to your audience. The, this thing, uh, your audience in particular, is one of the, the greatest uh, uh, influences on your writing that you're going to have. Think about who your audience is. Uh, what values they have, what degree of understanding about this thing you're describing already is, what can you expect them to already know? And in some writing assignments, like the ones I give you, I already tell you, you know, your writer, know, your reader knows this about this topic, or they don't know anything about this topic or whatever. So a lot of that will be given to you. Uh, sometimes not, though. You might be writing product descriptions for something uh, that the store you work for sells. And maybe this is a brand new type of product. So you might need to start at the beginning and explain just what this thing is, not just how it's better than everybody else's thing that they have. Right. The first description of the iPhone was like a three hour discussion uh, and uh, uh, a lot of that three hour discussion was, OK, this is one device that's got a bunch of things that it can do crammed into it. It happens to be a phone, but it's also all these other things. And we don't need that description nowadays because cell phones are ubiquitous. But audiences back then absolutely did. Um, so think about what your audience knows. Think about what they appreciate, what they don't appreciate. Um, both in, in, in uh, the language you use and in the things that you talk about. Um, but uh, what think about what value you want them to get from your description. If you're describing a place, do you want them to go to it or avoid it? Do you want them to uh, maybe have a similar type of experience you did so you uh, when you went there previously? So you describe um, all the, the interesting things that happened to you while you were there. Um, or maybe the scary things that happened to you while you were there. Maybe you went to one of those. Uh, last year I went to a, um, uh, a haunted cornfield, one of those corn mazes and whatnot. And it was huge. It was like, I don't know, I don't know. 30 acres, 40 acres, something like that. It's pretty big, pretty big cornfield, pretty big maze. And uh, you can get turned around in there pretty, pretty easily. It can be pretty creepy, right? Um, if I wanted somebody to, to go to that, to that corn maze, uh, I would describe, because I have some intimate knowledge of it, I would describe my experiences there. And even though it was, you know, kind of scary and creepy, obviously we were, we were all safe. There were plenty of, you know, uh, employees around the, the area that, that knew the place. No one was really going to get lost or anything like that. But, you know, it's there in the middle of the night and uh, you have nothing but creepy corn and echoes around you to, to guide you. And you've got to go from checkpoint to checkpoint to, to reach the end of the maze. Uh, I don't know. That's a lot of fun, actually. That was that was that was a, a pretty good deal. Um, so 
those are the types of considerations you you want to make what what do you want your audience to get to get out of it not just who is your audience and what do they value but what is it you're trying to get across to them what action do you want them to take or what do you want them to believe once you're finished uh, describing this thing that you're describing um, in addition there are some more logistical issues to consider regarding your audience um, are there terms that you might need to explain that your audience doesn't already know um, or maybe there are terms that your audience knows the the a, a particular meaning of but you're using them in a, in a different way right like if you're if you're playing a, a board game or even a video game or something like that sometimes you know certain characters or certain areas will be called something that's that we already use a term for in the real world right um and so you might have to explain what that particular term means in that particular game before you go too far ahead right um so consider your audience's knowledge consider your audience's uh values consider your audience's um uh, knowledge of the terminology you're going to be using or the, the topic that you're speaking about um and consider what it is that you want your audience to get out of this description um sometimes many times <clears throat> excuse me in writing assignments your uh, instructor your writing prompt will tell you what you're trying to 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 do to your audience but a lot of times that's more open and in the real world um sometimes that's not explicitly described to you either so just being able to think for a moment about what kind of uh what what it is you're trying to get across to your audience is going to make you able to provide a more effective description another element of the rhetorical context is your goal <clears throat> what is the point of this description not just what is it that you want to how is it that you want to affect the audience but what's the the very point why are you creating this text what is your what is your goal are you using it to explain something objectively as clearly and as straightforward as possible like say a medical diagnosis you don't want to spice that up with too much uh, uh, uh imaginative language right especially if it's bad news <clears throat> maybe you want to maybe you're describing something to help shape an argument that you're making maybe you're trying to convince the city council to spend some money to fill this pothole on a street near your home by describing the the damage that potholes do to cars or maybe the damage that it did to your car by doing that well you provide solid evidence for your argument that that pothole ought to be filled or maybe uh your goal is to just entertain a reader with maybe something funny or scary or or uh, beautiful uh those descriptions in a story either way uh the goal obviously will shape your word choice and the tone you take if you're writing a scary story you're going to use language that invokes uh, uh fear and dread and those kind of things uh hopefully you will not use that same language when you are giving someone their uh uh, uh i don't know their their breast cancer diagnosis right <clears throat> not a good rhetorical choice very different uh, uh, uh goals there so by recognizing by understanding your topic by knowing your audience pretty well and by uh, recognizing your goal these things particularly will help you uh, shape your description or they should your description isn't just written out uh, by no one for no one for no good reason there's always a purpose for these things there's always some writer who's trying to uh, uh, communicate to some audience and by knowing all of those things that's the very first thing we we have to know before we can write effective descriptions much less arguments or analyses so <clears throat> we've talked about the rhetorical uh, context as important for understanding how to build descriptions let's talk about what makes up descriptions the the key features 
of a description. I know this sounds silly. You just describe the thing. You look at what's there and you say what's there. If it's a red car, you've already said it's red in the car. What do you do? It's got some lights on it, some windows. You know, it's a car. But not exactly, right? A car from the 1800s, late 1800s, is very different than a car from the uh, early 20, 2020s, right? So leaving it at car leaves out a whole lot of, of, of understanding that your reader necessarily isn't going to pick up. So there's a lot of things that we add to descriptions, a lot of things that make up a description uh, that make it effective. Um, the key features are background information, a dominant impression, we'll talk about what that is in a second, important details, and expressive language. And what we're going to do, we're going to talk about each one of these things in turn, and then I have uh, at least an example of, uh, at least one example of uh, what paying attention to each one of these uh, key features looks like when it's actually uh, written out. So let's talk about background. Um, background is one of those things that you should think about, again, uh, as part of the rhetorical context. You, you think about what your audience knows about the subject, and, uh, you'll and based on that, you'll know how much background information to include as part of your description. If you're trying to describe an automobile to uh, someone who was born in the 1600s, let's say you go back in time, you can't just say, you know, it's a car. We didn't have that word, right? An automobile. What is what is what is that? So <clears throat> instead, what you have to do is you have to provide background information, things like names of of things, relationships, uh, just the most preliminary information about your subject, what it does, what it is, and explaining those things in a way that your audience can understand, not just so you understand it. So when we talk about background, you want to provide just enough information to let readers know something about the subject and where it lies in the larger context. If you've got uh, a description you're providing, make sure that they know what it is you are describing. So if you're describing a place, Make sure you name it, explain its purpose, and maybe the types of people that go there. Maybe describe its surroundings, especially if in any way they are unique when you, when you take a look at that location. If you're describing a person, name him or her. Describe their relationship to you or, or, or their significance, right? Why you're talking about this person maybe explain their occupation or, or, or status, whatever it is that, that uh, uh, makes them important to talk about in this particular case, explain that. Because your audience doesn't, doesn't know these people, they don't know these locations, they don't know whatever these objects are necessarily. If you're going to describe something unique about any of these things, they need to know first and foremost what these things are how do they compare to other things of the same type? Well, this guy's a, a colonel in the army. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's something important to know, probably. Those kind of things. When you provide this background information, it gives the reader a foundation for understanding the more specific information that you plan to provide later on in your description. But without that background information, the, the reader can't get on board. You may have a whole train of information you're going to provide, but, but if you don't provide that background information first, that train leaves the, the station before your reader gets to get on it. And so you need that core understanding uh, so that your reader can connect with the description that you're providing and with the value that you're going to try to, to get across to your reader about that description later on. So background information is one of the most fundamental things you can provide in a, in a description. And in fact, when we talk about essay writing, um, you know, that's the very first thing you provide in your introduction is the, the core information that your reader is going to need to 
understand the essay that you're writing about. Descriptions are no different. So let's look at an effective description given by someone who's driving from the city to a countryside villa in Italy. And I, I want you to note how the writer starts off by providing expressive background information. We, we not only know exactly where we are, where he is describing, but we also start to get a feel of this place that the writer is, is describing to us. <clears throat> so let's look at this text. I'm gonna to try to read it without stumbling. La Pietra, the stone, is situated one mile from the Porta San Gallo, an entry to the old city of Florence. You drive there along the Via Bolognese, twisting past modern apartment blocks until you come to a gate which swings open and there you are, at the upper end of a long lane of cypresses facing a great ochre palazzo with olive groves spreading out on both sides over an expanse of 57 acres. There's something almost comically wonderful about the effect. Here, the city, with its winding avenue. There, on the other side of a wall, the country, fertile and gray-green. That's a pretty good description, right? The author had the option to just describe his drive up the road and, and I went through a, uh, a, a gate and then there, uh, there wasn't any more city and it was just the country in front of me. Okay, but that leaves out a lot of, a lot of information, doesn't it? Where are we? Oh, we're in Italy. Okay, so hot and wet, uh, uh, typically, as far as uh, uh, the um, the weather is concerned, and we're driving this twisting path, right? We get up above uh, outside of town, and it's it's unique because through a uh, through just a single gate, it seems like a switch is flipped, and we go from modern urban Italy to uh, to the countryside. That's a pretty good setup. I don't know what's going to happen in this story, but I know where I'm at right? I've got a solid idea of, of uh, uh, where I am in the world and kind of what this place looks like. And also I'm starting to get a little bit of a, a of kind of a, a, an emotional feel of this place, right? We leave the, the busy twisting city and we get to um, uh, an expanse of 57 acres with olive groves spread out. So a lot, it feels more, it feels, feels more peaceful. It seems, uh, it, it brings the, the, at least the image to our head of, of something more slow paced too, maybe, right? None of this is said exactly in the text, but we get the idea. We go from the urban, the, the concrete to the countryside, the, the fertile, the gray green, you know? So that conjures to image, you know, plant or to conjures to mind the images of, of plant life and things like that. Not bad. It's a good start. <clears throat> so right there is a good example of providing enough background information. If you're describing a, uh, a location that you're that you're traveling to or whatnot, this is not a bad way to do it. It's not a bad way to get started. Let's move on. Another key feature of good description is uh, a dominant impression. The impression you give when you describe something, that's a choice you make on how you want to primarily present your subject. And you have a lot of different ways that you can present any subject. You can try to describe it as objectively as possible exactly as it appears with no uh, 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 no ob uh, subjectivity, no emotion tied to it, or you can be a little more subjective. You can try to describe something in a very positive light. Hey, you know what? I really like this, this uh, restaurant that I went to. You should go here too, and here's why. Or as something beautiful or ugly, as something frightening or exciting or welcoming or hostile. With any description, your goal is to create 
a single dominant impression. It can be a complicated one, but still a single dominant impression. If you just describe everything that you see and hear and smell and taste and each individual thing it does to you. Well, uh, I was at the fair and I had a good time and I went on the Ferris wheel and it was fun, but it got me dizzy and I ate a lot of food and the, the chicken, uh, the giant turkey leg was great, but the, uh, 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 oh, what's it called? I can't even, uh, the fried Oreo cookies made me sick. What's the point of this description? You're not like a five-year-old. I didn't ask you, did you have a good time? What I, you're being asked to describe this location. So have a theme. Have a, have a, what was your overall impression when you were there? You know, it was a hokey place to go full of, uh, 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 unhealthy but delicious food. And it's such a great, um, uh, 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 what's it called? Um, guilty pleasure. Okay, that's a good impression to start with. How can I describe this place as a guilty pleasure? Well, describing every ride that I went on just for no good reason, that's not very useful. Let's stick with the things that promote that idea of a, a guilty pleasure. Sure, there's a lot more to the fair than that, but I'm writing for someone else and I want them to see this particular thing. If I want to write about some other element of the, the, the fair, I can do that later too. But right now, my dominant impression is that this is a great, uh, fun, uh, 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 I, I guess wholesome, but maybe a little trashy. I don't know. It's hard to, it, some, some fairs, maybe your fairs are different than mine. Uh, where I'm from, um, experience that that's always kind of fun to go to, but uh, uh, you're gonna feel a little goofy afterwards. Anyway, with any description, as I said, your goal is to create that dominant impression, an overall feeling or emotion that the individual details that you provide will add up to. You choose that impression that you want your description to give. You might want your dominant impression, as I said, to be as a, to be objective, as free from opinion and emotion as possible. And that's common in some types of writing, particularly scientific writing and academic writing and actual journalistic writing, um, where the true account of events is, is of paramount importance. Obviously, for these things, the goal is to uh, uh, explain uh, reality, explain your observations as clearly as possible. However, it's not always the case, um, especially if you're trying to describe something for entertainment purposes or to uh, uh, give your own experiences, you're not going to be objective. You're going to provide some subjective emotional description, and those are powerful descriptions. That dominant impression usually isn't explicit. Usually it goes unsaid. Um, we, we let our, our descriptions do our talking for us. And by the time someone's done reading our description, they'll know whether a place is supposed to be scary or fun or, or uh, uh, fulfilling or, or whatever. So normally the dominant impression is, is implied. It grows naturally out of the details that you provide about the subject. However, sometimes some people will come out and explicitly state the impression that they're trying to give, and then they'll support it with details, almost as if they're presenting a, a, a logical argument. So you have a lot of options with describing a dominant impression uh, or, or with providing a dominant impression. I think, I think actually the, the, the easiest way to do it for, for me is to have the um, dominant impression implied instead of stated explicitly. But, but either way works fine. Either way can, can, can work for you. So let's look at an example. Here we have a description, an effective description, I would say, of a limestone quarry, right? A place where they dig up limestone and uh, maybe blast them out of the, the, the ground and cut them up and ship them off to make, uh, to make you know, stoneworks and stuff like that, countertops, things, things like that. Note that the writer actually, in this case, explicitly states 
the dominant uh, uh, the dominant impression that he wants to that he wants to express in this case that quarries are battlefields once he does that look at the language that he uses to create the feeling of a battlefield in reality he's walking around an empty quarry with nothing but dirt and old machinery around him <clears throat> and that's one way to describe it but it's not very descriptive it's not very detailed and it's not very evocative instead what he does here by choosing a dominant impression that he wants to provide he can then tailor his language to build that impression in the reader let's see if it let's see if it works the quarries will not be domesticated they're not backyard pools they are battlefields each quarry is an arena where violent struggles have taken place between machines and planet between human ingenuity and brute resisting stone between mind and matter waste rock litters the floor and brim like rubble in a bombed city stones weighing tens of tons lean against one another at precarious angles as if they have been thrown there by some gigantic strength and have not yet finished falling wrecked machinery hulks in the weeds grimly rusting the cogs and wheels twisted rails battered engine housings trackless bulldozers and burst boilers like junk from an armored regiment everywhere the ledges are scarred from drills as if from an artillery barrage or machine gun strafing stumbling into one of those abandoned quarries and gazing at the ruins you might be left wondering who had won the battle men or stone geez relax right guy so as you can see in that example <clears throat> we have a dominant impression this quarry is a battlefield and he spends uh, a lot of energy crafts a lot of language uh including language that you would see in a battle everything from um from uh being thrown by massive strength to wars between men and earth to machine gun barrage uh scars and all of that language is done not simply to describe the place so you can plot it down on a map or draw it by memory that's not the goal of most descriptions uh, again unless you're doing you know work for like the sciences or or, or uh, uh health or, or those kind of things this is a much more evocative description it, it, it helps us understand this place at least it helps us understand how this author understands this place a lot better and my image of that place is that it's kind of a brutalized um kind of a dangerous place right you've got those 10 ton stones barely uh standing up still kind of resting on on one another having been maybe thrown there precariously sharp chips of stone and whatnot all over the place rusted destroyed looking uh machinery like you know tanks that have gotten blown up in the past those kind of things it's a very evocative description walking there and looking at it it's probably just an empty hole in the ground but you can see that a good description can turn even an empty hole in the ground into something pretty interesting so we'll move on <clears throat> another uh, uh key element of uh effective description is uh important details without those details you you can't have a defect uh, an effective description really no matter no matter what else you you do a description is about the details if you gloss over the details you don't have a description you have a symbol you have kind of a, a a vague representation rather than an explicit understanding of something it's the uh uh, uh the as, as some people would point out it's the book learning version instead of the been in it up to my elbows version so when we talk about details we're talking about the relevant specific physical elements of the thing you're describing all the little pieces and parts that you might notice that you might see or hear or feel 
or even taste, um, experience, all of those little things um, are the details. Now, you don't have to describe all of them. Every detail doesn't necessarily match up with the impression you want to give, and so you, you can gloss over those. But the ones that do match, you absolutely want to provide some effective descriptions for. Using details lets you be as specific as possible, providing information that will help your audience imagine or make sense of your subject. Not every element of your subject, as I mentioned, needs to be described, but the ones you choose should be described in detail. And again, the ones you choose should be ones that are based on the impression that you want to give, uh, ones that you need to uh, uh, include so that your audience can understand, right? Background details, those kind of things. And specific details are more effective than labels, which give really, uh, which rarely give much information. For example, instead of saying that someone is a moron or someone's really smart, that doesn't tell us anything about that person. Let's say, let's say someone runs up to you on the street, grabs you by the arm, points to the other side of the street and says, you see that guy over there? He's an idiot. And then he runs off. Well, wait a minute. Is that guy really an idiot or is the guy that stopped me to tell me that he's an idiot just crazy? I don't know. Right. I don't know the guy who I don't know the guy who stopped me to scream at to scream about that other guy. And I don't know that other guy. So when you tell me something like like that guy is an idiot, that doesn't necessarily tell me anything about that guy. All it does is tell me that you think he's an idiot. So you see, without those details, without any details, I don't know what to believe. That description, that vague, he's an idiot, is meaningless. It doesn't tell me anything. Instead of just telling me that guy is an idiot, if the guy that ran up to me gave me specific reasons, if he showed me what that other person did or said to deserve the label of idiot, then I might, then I might believe him. Then it might be a better description, right? That guy is an idiot. He uh, uh, decided not to buy anything on, on, go out and buy stuff on Black Friday. He could have saved so much money. All right. Well, I guess, I mean, that is a, a more descriptive uh, reason. I can value or not value the need to go out on Black Friday and, and fight with other people to try to buy, uh, buy stuff for consumerism purpose. But it's better to give those details, right? So that your readers can understand and hopefully agree with your assessment of the reasons behind that label. This lets us do that showing versus telling thing, right? By giving specific details, we show the reader how someone is a moron or really smart. We show how a building is beautiful when we describe its intricately wrought ironwork um, staircase or three-story staircase or something like that, right? Um, those examples create a real uh, concrete image in your reader's mind and uh, are much more effective than just telling the reader about a place or a person or an object and expecting that person to just believe you. As far as that person is concerned, you're that crazy guy who ran up to them on the street and said, hey, that guy's an idiot. Uh, all right, crazy guy. It's not so effective. So those specific details give the reader a better overall understanding of our subject. They're, they're key not only to evocative description, but also just straight up effective description. Now keep in mind details also, also include sensory descriptions, those involving what you see, hear, smell, feel, and taste. Uh, sensory descriptions are particularly effective at giving readers the physical sense of your subject. So not only describing what a thing looks like or how old it is, that's, that's kind of vague. Describe someone's long stringy gray hair. 
or uh, unkempt, filthy nails like they've been digging in the earth. And you can see right there, that's showing. Now your reader can picture that. If you say this person was old, that can mean a lot of things. There's a lot of old out there. And some of that old's kind of sexy, and some of that old's like, yeah, uh, what's wrong with you? Like, uh, what was that lady in uh, Emperor's New Groove? Like her. I just found out Eartha Kitt did her voice. Uh, 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 one of the women that played Catwoman in the uh, 1960s Batman. That was, that was nice to know. Anyway, go look up Eartha Kitt sometime. She's awesome. Um, forgot what my point was. Old can be a lot of different things. However, that description of those fingernails, that hair, droopy eyelids, uh, uh, zombie plague, bringer-like shuffle, almost falling at every step. Those, however, are much more descriptive details that provide your reader with a real understanding of what the place looks like. Without those descriptions, uh, you're not considering your audience. You're not giving them enough to work on. You're, you're just kind of talking to yourself. You know what you mean when you describe a place, but without those details, your reader won't. So let's look at another effective description, this time using important details. Um, in this particular case, we're, we're, we're talking about a, a woman, or the, the writer is a woman who's living with uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, notice how these specific important details that are used help us create a more powerful image um, than it's than multiple sclerosis uh, like uh, medical definition as provided by the National uh, MS Society. I've got both. I've got both descriptions here. We're going to read her description of her illness, and then we're going to read um, a brochure's description of of this illness. And let's see which one has more of an impact. Uh, here's her description. During its course, which is unpredictable and uncontrollable, one may lose vision, hearing, speech, the ability to walk, control of bladder and bowels, strength in all extremities, sensitivity to touch, vibration and or pain, potency, coordination of movements, the list of possibilities is lengthy and yes, horrifying. One may also lose one sense, one sense of humor, that's the easiest to lose and the hardest to survive without. Characteristic of MS are sudden attacks called exacerbations, followed by remissions, and these I have not had. Instead, my left leg is now so weak that I walk with the aid of a brace and cane. I no longer have the use of my left hand. Now my right side is weakening as well. I still have the blurred spot in my right eye. You can see right there that those are very specific descriptions. <clears throat> we have a uh, very evocative, um, very compelling description of what just one person's life is like or, or feels like as they uh, battle with multiple sclerosis. It's a very intimate picture that has been created for us and hopefully some of uh, some of that language uh, emotionally moved you because this is a a, a a pretty compelling description we see not just what it does but but it's it's its effects on someone how they can lose their sense of humor how just every day they walk with the aid of a brace and a cane and, and they still have that blurred spot in their right eye. Those are real specific. I see this person, right? And I can, I can visualize and maybe more easily empathize with what they're going through. Compare that to a, a, a general, very explicit description by the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Multiple sclerosis is a chronic, unpredictable disease of the central nervous system where the immune system incorrectly attacks the person's healthy tissue. 
MS can cause blurred vision, cause blurred vision, loss of balance, poor coordination, slurred speech, tremors, numbness, extreme fatigue, problems with memory and concentration, paralysis, and blindness. These problems may be permanent or they may come and go. That doesn't have the emotional impact, does it? In fact, that description sounds like 50 different diseases that we might be aware of. Anybody who's ever been on uh, 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 WebMD or something like that, all of these sound like the same disease to a certain degree, or they, they may even sound like some uh, uh, side effects that you might get from, uh, from, a cer from certain medications. Oh yeah, I've heard all these before. But it's very different seeing a description, a first person description of this disease from an actual sufferer, doesn't it? And that's the difference between providing details and not providing details. Without those details, we, we don't have the same sense of the situation as if it's just described to us. That's the power of description. By providing effective description by giving us details by considering uh, uh, by providing us with the background information we need by um, creating and following a particular impression so that we understand this thing in in at least one facet that the writer wants us to understand it in um, we can really produce uh, a writer can produce a lot of meaning can get across um, really important things to an audience. That's how we learn, is by transmitting information. And so, <clears throat> it's particularly important to be able to describe things well, so that we can uh, transmit not only our experiences, but also our knowledge. And even when our knowledge is sometimes boring, like say, our class, perhaps, no, this class is never boring, even in those examples, a little bit of, of effective description, maybe some anecdotes, a few stories, some folksy Southern uh, uh, storytelling, maybe can make it a little, uh, uh, a little more entertaining, a little less of a slog, and show that, that some of what we're talking about um, has real world value. It's almost like I do it on purpose. Last big key feature of uh, solid description is expressive language. In addition to providing details, what you also want to do is consider your word choice. Use evocative words and figurative language, maybe even introduce some dialogue from characters or anecdotes, experiences that you've had to bring your subject to life and provide more than a, a sterile, lifeless description. <clears throat> Evocative words are those that have an emotional weight to them. We've already talked about them a little bit before. <clears throat> These words not only have an, their own explicit meaning, but they project a feeling of some sort. Evocative words allow you to describe a subject in a way beyond its literal appearance. Uh, for example, using evocative words, a nervous character doesn't just sit, they perch on the edge of their seat. Likewise, someone running from you might slink away into the darkness, like a cockroach or whatever, or scamper just out of reach. And you can see by using, by, by switching up your language and using more expressive words, you put into your reader's head a particular visual image. I even just used a simile right there, which we're gonna talk about in a second, scurried away like a cockroach. That's a simile. So by using that language, we not only uh, make our, our story more entertaining and interesting, but we actually make it more descriptive as well. If we have uh, an idea of, some, of someone uh, running away uh, cowardly, avoiding a problem that they should be should be facing, we might say uh, uh, slink away like uh, I don't know uh, what's something that's cowardly. 
like a I don't know or, or something that that doesn't seem uh, particularly particularly brave uh, slinking away um, like a, a, a scalded dog is what we would say in the south but um, um, <clears throat> like a wounded animal there we go there's our uh, uh, everyday use reference anyway we also not just use uh, expressive words, but we can also use figurative language, uh, language that expresses an idea beyond its literal meaning. And the most common types of figurative language uh, are similes, metaphors, oxymorons, hyperboles, and personification. And here I give you some examples of them. And, and you do it all the time. And if you've ever listened to rap or, 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 or hip hop, you'll see that they're full of, of similes and metaphors and uh, and personification especially um, so these are things that you're already quite familiar with it's just a matter of um, practicing them practicing incorporating them and, and using effective ones that match up with your uh, impression that you're trying to give so let's look at these a simile compares two things suggesting that they are alike in some way and uh, the thing about similes is that that they use uh, they create this comparison using the words like or as. So, for example, one example of a, of a simile is that guy is as strong as an ox. So here we're comparing that guy's strength to that of an ox using the word as. And obviously he's not really as strong as an ox. That's also uh, a hyperbole. But um, but we have a, a very we have a sense of just how strong this guy is right he's stronger than the average average person strong as an ox okay it doesn't have to tell us any more than that uh uh but it, it uses the same word word count that says this guy is really really strong give or take but instead it puts an image of, of the power of an ox in our head. And so it, it, in some situations, it might be a lot more effective. Or this wooden support beam is as thick as a sequoia. Well, we know how, how large sequoias get. They get pretty thick. And this wooden support beam is as thick as a sequoia, right? And that's similes. Metaphors work like similes. They describe one thing as something else that's not necessarily like. Uh, in this case, though, it doesn't use like or as. Um, examples include love is a battlefield. Um, the children were flowers grown in a concrete garden. Right. So you can see that what a metaphor does, it describes one thing in uh, as something else entirely. <clears throat> and by doing that, it it puts an image in your reader's head that this one thing is like something else. And instead of them having to come directly out and 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 describe every physical trait of that thing that matches up with the thing they're comparing it to, they just say, hey, Love is a battlefield. Love equals battlefield. Huh. And that, that creates an image. These children were flowers grown in a concrete garden. Okay. I get the, the image of these things being good things growing up in a maybe a, a, a empty, barren, hard, maybe hostile environment. Sounds like that's probably the image they want me to get. 
Um, then there's oxymorons. Uh, oxymorons feature two words that seem to be the opposite of one another. They seem to contradict one another, but yet they can still effectively describe your situation. For example, that dog is pretty ugly. Well, it's a different use of the word pretty where we mean very, right? But it's still an oxymoron. You can't be pretty and ugly. So that description puts into our head an, I, uh, an idea, even though it's not very detailed, um, of uh, that this dog isn't just ugly, it's real ugly, right? Another example is there is a deafening silence in the room. Well, silent, some, silence can't be deafening. Something that's quiet or, not, or, or that doesn't make a sound obviously can't deafen you. In this case, though, when we talk about deafening silence, it's one of those silences that everybody's kind of aware of, right? It's an uncomfortable silence. And so by using deafening silence, the writer here uses this oxymoron to, to put in to our heads an image of a very awkward, very obvious silence. There's also hyperbole which you might hear on the local news a lot. Hyperbole is just when you create an unrealistic exaggeration. You stretch things further than they, than they realistically go. Most hyperbole is designed to be um, recognized as such. Sometimes though, people use hyperbole uh, and try to convince you of that hyperbole. So it's, it's important to, to read these things critically. But uh, an example here is, my granddad is as old as time. Well, not really, right? Time existed, well, probably always, even when it didn't. I don't know, I don't know how anybody can be as old as time. It's like when a student writes an essay that starts, since the dawn of time, man has wanted a close shave. Well, first of all, man didn't exist at the dawn of time, so that's not even true. But second of all, that's a meaningless hyperbole, right? Hyperbole is useful when you want to provide um, an evocative description, but not when you want to try to uh, uh, explain reality. A hyperbole is by uh, its very own definition an exaggeration. So it's usually not too good to start off with hyperboles. Instead, save that for your actual descriptions. Another example would be, I will literally die if you don't buy that ring for me. Oh yeah, prove it. No one's gonna die if you don't buy them a ring, right? If they do, that person, I, I don't know, that, that, is, that is a person with a weak heart, <laughs> a real weak heart, or someone who's no one, who no one has ever said no to, which is just as bad. <clears throat> no one's gonna die truly literally die if you don't buy something for them like a ring uh and so that's obviously hyperbole and the goal of that is to just to show you how important that particular purchase is to your author so you can use hyperbole for for good reasons the examples i gave you are a little are a little goofy but but don't get in the idea that hyperbole is always bad sometimes many times uh hyperbole is used very effectively to show uh, how the author truly values something. By exaggerating it beyond belief, uh, your writer shows us that this thing has um, <clears throat> uh, uh, some sort of extreme role that it's playing. Lastly is personification. And there are more figurative language uh, types besides the ones I've given you. These are just the most common, the ones that I would expect you to use uh, in a writing assignment. <clears throat> and personification is when human characteristics are attributed to inanimate objects. It's when we describe an inanimate object as if it were a living thing, particularly a person. An example might be lightning danced across the sky. Well, obviously, lightning doesn't dance. It just, you know, jumps from nearest point to, to nearest point until it can find a place to, to ground itself. But that really doesn't have the same sort of, a, of a emotional quality that lightning danced across the sky does, right?
lightning danced across the sky is is poetic it's beautiful right <clears throat> and sometimes in our heads we 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 remember moments where we we felt like lightning was doing that right dancing around almost beautifully sure it's incredibly destructive but maybe we're in a safe place watching from a distance and it it uh, uh seeing the natural world in its splendor maybe it does feel like it's dancing well that's personification lightning can't literally dance but we attribute that particular characteristic to it and when a writer does that they create in that description almost a personality for that object another example is the wind sang a song through the trees wind doesn't actually sing we get that but we can tell what's happening here by by blowing through the trees the the rustling of the 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 leaves and the 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 swaying of the branches right it creates a pleasing sound maybe something even melodious the wind's not literally singing though but by using that personification we create a character almost in the wind and in fact we uh you see a lot of that personification uh specifically to build a uh a type of impression you see some of that personification in the description of that limestone quarry right where a lot of these um uh inanimate objects were given um lifelike qualities <clears throat> and you can see very readily just how much that creates um uh, uh an impression an emotional impression not just not just visually but we feel this place as well anyway you can see that there's a lot that can go into a solid description it's not about smarts it's not about looking at every single facet that you could possibly describe uh, about a particular person or object or location it's about kind of taking a stance how do you want to present this object this person this location to your reader choose and once you've made that choice and thought about everything your reader needs to know about it <clears throat> to understand your description then you can kind of use all these techniques we've been talking about to really uh, uh, build uh, uh, an impressive a strong an evocative a powerful description that not only allows the reader to know where they're at or know who they're 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 talking to or know what they're looking at but to to feel those things right to to call upon experiences that the reader has already had and tie those experiences to something brand new an object a person a location and make that thing that was previously entirely unfamiliar uh feel very familiar perhaps sometimes too familiar depending on how you're trying to describe it you can you can make something f feel very scary not just not just uh, uh happy or exciting or whatever so these are the tools that good writers use to describe things effectively and as i've as i've constantly been saying as you can see these rules that we use for reading and writing they're not uh they're not ephemeral they're not imaginary it's not one of those things that you're either good at or you're bad at and that's just how it goes these are literal tools that we use to improve our writing and the more that you use these tools the better you understand them the better a writer you'll be and honestly the better reader you'll be as well because you'll be able to point out whenever you read fiction or nonfiction, <clears throat> when your author is using these techniques and when these techniques work when they don't work so well when they're convincing when they um, are misleading 
So by, by knowing your tools, you can do a lot with them. It helps you become a more critical uh, reader and a more effective writer and communicator in general. So um, that's what we've, we're, we've, we, I wanted to talk about uh, in this lecture. That's the end of our lecture today. Um, I want to thank everybody for um, joining me here. Uh, stay safe, everybody, and um, I'll see you again real soon. Bye.